The science is it's utterly deplorable, but you're right, I'm not seeing any penalties. So is this being recorded? <laughs> I, I think you're already in trouble. It doesn't matter what you say now. Anyway, I, I'll just I'll leave it. I'll just say I agree with you that we're not seeing penalties. Perhaps we should be seeing seeing penalties, and I probably won't say any more. When I actually try and engage mainstream medicine doctors in debate, um, they don't want to debate me. We're, you know, Ethan Weiss, a cardiologist, Dr. Allo. Um, you know, who's come out there and I, I've said, well, let's talk about this, you know, but, and they just go silent. So these guys, you know, they, they, they want to sort of pressure their patients. They'll gaslight their patients and they'll say, well, if you don't take this drug, there's nothing I can do for you. But then if I'm saying, well, I'm curious, can you show me your evidence? You're just crickets. I wanted to elaborate on Jay's point on intention to treat, because very frequently what I've seen studies involving a ketogenic diet is that you have more dropouts on the ketogenic diet arm, and that's frequently interpreted as it was unsustainable. These people hated the diet, they missed on breath too much, and therefore this argues against the tolerability of a ketogenic diet. But very frequently, especially in weight loss trials, what you see if you get access to the data is that those who are dropping out is because they already lost weight. So sometimes intention to treat means that from a participant's perspective, I already got the benefit I was looking after. And so, let's um, also not forget that even with these limitations, that all the research on ketogenic diets overwhelmingly is still finding in favor. Yeah. Yeah, so e absolutely. even with the intention to treat limitations. Absolutely. No. I genuinely do my best to steel man the arguments of the other side, if you will. And in the case of the new commonality as you outlined in your talk for having a run-in period for a study. That's the one I constantly glitch up on. I want to challenge you to help me understand what's the best case that a pharmaceutical trial could make for why a run-in period is appropriate. Well, they could make it for saying, we don't want people who are gonna have worse side effects than usual taking our drugs. If I, the only argument I could make for a run-in period is saying, well, this prevents our drugs causing harm. It let, well, it doesn't prevent. This reduces the risk of our drugs causing significant harm in this population. However, to do so is an acknowledgement that these drugs do cause harm, that they do have side effects. So I don't think, I, I don't know, do, do you have any particular, are you able to justify a run-in period in, in any universe? I it's been the toughest one of all. Like, honestly, of, of, of all things, I, I'm surprised it's allowed. It, it, the way that we normally describe a randomized control trial is that you have like the starting point of the randomization being the very first thing that happens. But I think it would be more justifiable if they at least recorded that as well, if they had a you know, run-in period. Well, the, the data, I mean, when they said, look, we, we'll drop out you know, so many thousand subjects and then we'll do a run-in period, oh, another 5,000 subjects disappear. So you have to understand that when they, the run-in period I was talking about, they had already screened everybody and said, do you tolerate a statin? So they'd already screened out people who were known to be statin intolerant. And then, they, and it's the same with the liver enzymes. So, you know, when they said, oh, if the liver enzymes go over three, they consider that a problem, but they had already eliminated people from the study who, one of the, one of the exclusion criteria we did get access to was that if their liver enzymes increased during the run-up period, then they were excluded. But if they increased to the level of 1.5, <laughs> but then they set the threshold at three. Uh, you, I mean, you can, and if you understand a normal distribution, the, the bell curve, so to speak, that once you go change a threshold, when you're doubling the threshold, you're not just halving the number of people who are reaching that. I mean, the reality is with the way the normal distributions work for liver enzymes, you're probably getting less than one or 2% of, of the people that you are massively reducing the people who are going to cross that, that threshold of three times normal liver enzymes. Like that, it's just, there's some very smart people who are doing their very best to skew results at the end of the day. Thanks. Have you looked at any of the evidence or that went into making risk calculators? Yes. 
Um, I've only got two minutes, but I'll say they're, they're bollocks. They overestimate risk significantly. There is, uh, but the fact is risk calculators do skew results massively. We overestimate risk. It's been proven. So when a doctor says, oh, we only put you on a statin if you're at more than 10% risk of a heart attack, and then they put you into this calculator, which might you know, double the risk. I mean, this is another part of this whole mechanism, which is funneling people. We're, we're, we're medicalizing things that don't need to be medicated. The simple fact is that it was over like a 30 year period that the number of people eligible for statins increased by 600%. So it's just part of the funnel of pushing people into pharmacology.